Hey guys, it's Kaylin. It's time to do our lecture for chapter two. I hope week one of school is going well for you guys. So we're going to start off by talking about, I actually need to share my screen. So let's do that. Sorry about that. I didn't forget to share my screen before we started the lecture. Um, we're going to start out by talking about the classical views of leadership and management. A lot of people think that just because you're a manager, or you're a leader, or that leadership and management are the same thing. There are principles that kind of work with both, but they are different. So leadership versus management. Leaders empower others, maximize work workforce effectiveness. Um, they're needed to implement the planned change that is part of system improvement. Oh, sorry. And managers, they guide, direct, and motivate others. They intervene when goals are threatened, and the emphasis is more on control. So the way I like to think about this um, in a healthcare se setting, um, for me personally, I like to use the example of um, a clinical nurse specialist. That's what um, my degree and my specialty is. So um, CNSs can definitely be thought about leaders because they are working on system improvement. They work with direct care nurses to help them um, be empowered, to help them further their education, to understand work proce um, processes. They will sometimes do kind of look, listen to see how processes are happening and then work on creating a project plan to improve something. Um, they don't have direct managerial capacity over anybody. They don't, they are like an informal leadership within a system because they don't actually have the capacity to like hire or fire anybody, but they definitely are leaders in how they create change through the system and help direct care nurses feel empowered with the knowledge they're given. And then you think of a manager, like a unit manager, definitely is the management side of things because they have to look at how the unit is being run. They um, do want to guide and direct others at the piece of what they do, but when something's being threatened, they intervene and they have to do that piece of um, talking to nurses if something's not done right, and that management, those management things that leaders don't necessarily have to do. And sometimes they are both. You are a leader and a manager at times, but you can be a leader without being a manager. So other things to compare the two of them. Leaders often do not have delegated authority, but obtain their power through other means. So like I said, they don't, like, like a clinical nurse specialist, for example, um, they have authority because they are the expert in that field. And, um, but they don't have the power to discipline or any, like something like that, but they're still definitely leaders. Um, they have a wider variety of roles than managers and have many different personal goals. They are frequently not part of the formal organization. They focus on group process, information gathering, feedback, and empowering others. So um, like I said, the clinical nurse specialist thing is a great example of that. It's looking at the whole process, the group process, wanting to make um, a specific unit or patient population better. Um, and looking at how the process is done, what can we do to change it, implementing that change, working with the staff to make sure it's um, implemented and, and then evaluated at the end. That's all something that a leader would do but you don't have to be a manager to do that. Um, the same thing for direct care nurses um, can get involved in shared governance in those kind of areas where they can be leaders and start implementing change within an organization or institution, but they're not managing anything. They are um, have other goals from the organization. Within the organization, they have personal goals on um, wanting to maybe um, further themselves, but they are not in a managerial position. The managers are always assigned to a position within an organization. They have that clear cut what their uh, role and duties are. They have legitimate source of power due to the delegated authority that accompanies their position. So, you know, they are the manager of an intensive care unit. That is their, um, what their title is. Then they do have the authority to hire, fire, discipline um, their staff. That, that is 
clearly written into their position. They are expected to carry out specific functions. They have a um, definite like job duties and they and they state what they need to do that are clearly defined. They emphasize control, decision making, decision analysis, and results. Um, 10 fatal leadership flaws. So these are those things that leaders kind of can miss the ball on and um, it doesn't mean they're a good leader, but it's things that leaders need to be looking at themselves and working on consistently. So a lack of energy and enthusiasm. If you are a leader and you're wanting to um, implement a new process change within your area of expertise, you need to be enthusiastic about it. You have to spark that want for change so that direct care staff also want to. Because if you're not excited about it, why would they want to put the work in and make change? Acceptance of their own mediocre performance. So as a leader, it's really important to be self-aware and know when you are not meeting up to the standards that you're setting for others and be able to acknowledge that and work on that performance. Um, lack of a clear vision or direction. So as a leader, sometimes you can kind of be all over the pay place with ideas, big thought ideas, but not have a clear set and know the road you're going to take. So leaders in the beginning sometimes will come up with multiple different ideas for a problem, but that can be an issue because once you're wanting to implement and change, you need to have clear vision and direction for that so that the people that are following your leadership know how to implement the plan. Having poor judgment. Obviously, that is something that would be a flaw for a leader. Um, not collaborating. You know, we speak of this all the time within leadership and management as well. Le being a leader means that you're willing to collaborate with others and know that your ideas are not the only ideas. Um, that you look to others for, that are, for their expertise to help you as you lead through um, a project not walking the talk. So you're saying these are the things that we need to do, this is how things are supposed to be implemented and operated, but you yourself aren't actually doing that either. So um, how is anybody gonna respect you as a leader if you yourself aren't able to implement it? Uh, resisting new ideas. So this is again, like when you're collaborating with people and they have an idea that as a leader, you're able to take that information in and um, really contemplate and think about it and have open discussions. If you just um, disregard any ideas from anybody else, no one's gonna take you seriously and no one's gonna respect you as a leader. Not um, learning from mistakes. So this is a big one because as a leader, you will fail. You'll um, try to work on something, try to, do, try to implement a project and it might not work and that's okay. Um, you, we talk about this a lot in evidence-based practice and research. You may have a hypothesis, you have something that's gonna happen and it doesn't happen, it's not, it doesn't work out the way you thought it was. That doesn't mean you failed, that means that you have learned something, you know this doesn't work, so what's the next thing we can try? So really um, reflecting once you have made a mistake um, and learning from it is really important as a leader. Lack of interpersonal skills. So a big thing with leaders is that um, people are able to connect with them. Um, people feel safe and feel that they can come to them with their issues, that they'll be heard, um, and they can work well with others. That's really, really important. And failing to develop others. So um, I don't know if a lot of you have heard of Simon Sinek. He's a huge, a big author on leadership, and um, he's actually um, written a book called um, he, he wrote Starts With Why, so you talk about the why of what you're doing everything, but then he also wrote a book that's called um, Leaders Eat Last. And that's one of the biggest pieces of leadership is that you're not so, most, so much focused on yourself and your own development. That's a piece of what you do, but you are there to develop others. It's not about you and your leadership and you running everything. It's about making others feel they can help, they can make this happen, that they had a part of it and they're able to develop themselves and helping them move into maybe a leadership role in the future. Those are great, really big things and fatal leadership flaws. So 
if you're if you're have if you have these things, then you're probably not a leader and you need to work on them. But they're um, things that can really um, tie down our leaders and kind of help make them fall. So characteristics of managers, they have an assigned position within a formal organization like we talked about before. They have a legitimate source of power due to the delegated authority that accompanies their position. Like I said, they have a specific job description that tells them what needs to be done um, well, um, throughout their work. They are expected to carry out specific functions, duties, and responsibilities. They emphasize control, decision making, decision analysis, and results. They manipulate people, the environment, money, time, and other resources to achieve organizational goals. So um, for an example, part of a, manager, a unit manager's duties are to meet budget for that unit. That means that they will have to look at the schedule, look at how many employees they have, look at their patient population, look at how much money their budget is, um, and kind of sometimes shuffle around staff, change things up because their goal is to meet budget. It might be looking at what supplies are being used and utilized, and do we need to order something different? Those are all part of the managerial side of things. They have a greater formal responsibility and accountability for rationality and control than leaders do. Um, so they are completely, they usually are responsible for a certain group of people and accountable for what those people do. Um, leaders don't really have that. Leaders, um, try to develop and lead people through a solution, but if that person fails, it doesn't really fall back on the leader as much as um, the manager when they're managing the people that are directly under them. They are direct, willing, and unwilling um, subordinates. So, you know, they have their subordinates directly under them, and then they also usually have somebody above themselves. So good leaders and good managers. Good leaders envision the future. They um, think about what's happening now and what's gonna happen later, kind of see the trends and things that have happened in the past, looking at the present and moving forward. They communicate their visions. They don't keep it to themselves. They have that open discussion with people about what they're thinking. They motivate, they motivate their followers. That's a huge one. Um, leaders have followers and followers are also very important because um, you really can't get anything done if there's not someone leading the initiative and those following behind that are making it happen. They influence others to accomplish their goals, so along that same lines. They inspire confidence, so someone that's a leader really makes their followers feel like they're making an impact and they're doing something good. They take risks, so being a leader, you're willing to fail because you're then going to reflect on that and learn from your failures, and sometimes it takes risks to do that. Um, they empower, so they empower their followers, we talked about that, and they're a master of change. But leaders are not afraid of change. Those that get stuck in where they're at and say this is always have we, how we've done it are not leaders. Leaders see that things need to change over time um, to continue and improve our processes. So good managers coordinate resources, so they're the ones you can go to that know Everyone throughout the organization and who you need to go to for certain things. They optimize resource use. They meet organizational goals and objectives, like we talked about with the budget. They have they they are really looking at the organizational goals as a whole um, and trying to meet those objectives. They follow the rules. Um, they're very they're more planned and precise, very organized, like plan, organize, control, and direct. Those are those are what lead managers do. They use reward and punishment effectively to achieve organizational goals. So, you know, those um, staff that are, that are meeting goals and doing what needs to be done appropriately may get awarded. Um, they may get like a pizza party, those kind of things you see happen sometimes. Um, and then staff that are not doing what are supposed to be done could be written up and counseled over those issues. That's something that a manager would do, not necessarily a leader. So first question, what aspect of business should managers emphasize? A, decision-making, B, analysis, C, results, D, control, or E, all of the above? The answer is E, all of the above, of course. Um, control, decision-making, analysis, and results are all crucial elements of the successful manager. I'm gonna pause for a second and take my bracelets off because I feel like they're jingling and that might be distracting for you guys. Sorry. Okay. 
So our question number two for the lecture, which is a characteristic of a leader? So remember the difference between leader, leaders and managers. Always assigned a position of authority, usually part of a formal organization, focus on a group process, information gathering and feedback, focus on decision-making and results. So of course that would be C, they focus on group process, information gathering and feedback. Remember, leaders aren't managers. They're, you know, the difference between the two. Although managers are more often part of a formal organization and focus on more result-oriented tasks, leaders tend to focus more on things such as a group process. So the Frederick Taylor Scientific Management has four principles to it. And this is the traditional rule of thumb, scientific personnel system, workers fit into the organization and relationship between managers and workers is um, cooperative and interdependent. And then there's the Henry Foyle management functions and this has five um, functions to it, which are that you need to plan, organize, command, coordination, and control. So that makes sense when you think about it. When I am a manager and I'm wanting to implement a change or a function and plan what I'm going to do, I need to evaluate my organization and organize and organize my process, command, be be over everything, make sure people fully know what's going on, coordinate to make sure those processes happen, and then stay in control over it. So management process, kind of what we just, this is a graph to help you if you are more of a visual person, you would start with planning, then organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. That's what managers do. They plan, organize, but staff, direct, and control. So planning in um, compasses determining philosophy, goals, objectives, policies, procedures, and rules, carrying out long and short range projections, determining a fiscal course of action, and managing that planned change. So you're first um, talking about what your goals and objectives are, making sure you know the policies and rules of what you're going to be doing, and have your like long range and short range projections and goals that helps you when you're planning out that course of action. Organizing. This includes establishing the structure to carry out plans, determining the most appropriate type of patient care delivery, and grouping activities to meet unit goals. Um, this I think is very clear to understand. You're gonna you need you need to have a clear structure when you're when you're gonna implement something that you need to know. Um, the appropriate patient care delivery and how you need to group things together um, to meet, meet the goals. And other functions involve working within the structure of the organization and understanding and using the power and authority appropriately. So understanding how your, your organization is structured and works will help you be able to do this. So I think kind of, of like maybe I'm looking at the process of how we bathe our patients. I need to understand how my unit is set up, what my nurse to patient ratio is, what my nursing assistant to patient ratio is, and how many nursing assistants are within each nurse. Um, and it could be the nurses delegating to the nursing assistant that we um, need to do baths, but I know that we only have one nursing assistant at night and there's four during the day. So then my most type, my most appropriate patient care delivery would be to assign that task to our day shift nursing assistants because there's more of them and they, they would be able to implement that task. It's just like very, very simple example of kind of like organizing your time, you're like looking at the task, how my organization is set up and, and what would be most appropriate um, when implementing something. Staffing, this is kind of what we just talked about. Consists of recruiting, interviewing, hiring, orienting staff, scheduling staff development, employee socialization, team building, and also, um, included as staff functions so you know like you you that's part of what you're reviewing as a manager i have i had to organize and i saw well we only have one um clinical or not clinical nurse, sorry they um one nursing assistant i was thinking cna on um at night and i may need to be recruiting more when i obviously I'm recruiting more that includes interviewing and hiring and orienting them but I need that extra staff if I decide that I want to implement that bath time at night during, instead of during the day because the day shift nursing assistants have other things that they're having 
to complete and work on. Um, so that's a part of the staffing, always knowing where, where your staffing is, what you need, what each function your staff have. So knowing your own role, but then knowing the roles of those that are underneath you. And then of course, recruiting, interviewing, hiring, and making sure that the staff, once they are hired, have a good organizational process and that they know how to schedule. And then you develop them while they are your staff. The staff don't feel like they're being developed and being able to learn things when there are new processes, they'll get burnt out. Directing. This usually entails human resource management responsibilities such as motivating, managing conflict, delegating, communicating, and facilitating collaboration. Um, so you think of the same scenario that if there's an issue between the day shift and night shift CNAs on who's going to perform these ads, you as the manager would step in and you would manage that conflict to have um, the conversation on okay, well, I see that this is an issue. Uh, it's gonna be the responsibility of the night shift CNAs, say, that's the, the decision you make, and that we're gonna hire more staff in to make sure that can happen so that staff, the night shift staff, um, CNAs feel supported and they have enough staff to be able to make that happen. So um, you, and then you collaborate with them to make sure they understand and they're all okay. So that's kind of how that happens. You know, you're gonna motivate them to them know I'm gonna hire more staff. We're gonna, you're gonna be able to do this. You manage the conflict because you spoke to them and made sure there was a clear, like delegated clearly this is gonna be night shift doing this and everybody is understanding. So that's kind of the direct piece. Controlling, this includes performance appraisals, fiscal accountability, quality control, legal and ethical control, and professional and legal, legal control. So you are, as a manager, you're over this group of staff, and it can include nursing, it can include special, or um, it can include specialists, it can include CNAs, and you usually will do yearly performance appraisals on them. And it's not just telling them how great they are, what they did wrong, but part of a performance appraisal is we're looking at how they did and discussing what their goals are for the future and how you can help them meet those. Um, fiscal accountability are people you're watching your budget for within that unit that you're running um, looking at do I have staff that are riding the clock and maybe getting incident what we call incidental overtime so it's not going into overtime but they work three 12-hour shifts that's 36 hours a week but they did 38 this week where were those two hours? What happened? That's not technical overtime, but that's incidental overtime because that's two hours you weren't planning on paying them for the week. And um, why were they here those extra few hours? And then legal and ethical control and um, professional control. So questions. Tell whether the statement is true or false. Team building is an aspect of staffing. This is true. Although recruiting, interviewing, and hiring are the tasks most often associated with staffing, team building is also an important aspect of the job. Um, so you, you, when you think about that, um, with if you staffing, you want to have the staff that, that on your unit. If you're not building your team up and they don't feel that their role is, um, that, that people understand their role and they value it, then they may not want to stay and then you'll have high turnover. So part of staffing is having a reduction in your turnover, a reduction of those um, nurses or CNAs that are leaving. And um, part of making sure they feel valued and that they want to stay is building them up as a team. So the Luther Bluick, I don't think I'm saying his last name <laughs> correctly, is seven, um, it has seven activities of management. And they kind of go along with what we've been talking about. Planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. And then the human relations error. This is participatory management humanistic management and emphasizes people rather than machines, produces the Hawthorne effect. So this is where you're really working and looking at um, that, this is, that this is a person, an individual, not just a nurse on the unit. Now this is Susan and this is, and she's been a nurse for 23 years and these are her specialties and this is what I can do to make her better. Not just this is a person filling a slot 
for the day, but really understanding your people and, and their, um, what, what they're good at. So leadership. Leadership is the art of getting to work done um, through others willingly. So like I said, we've said talked about before with leaders, they aren't necessarily over somebody, but they have the ability to motivate somebody and make somebody want to do something for them and to help them create, um, accomplish a goal because they are excited about it. They are motivating people like this person. And it's, um, they like them because they're getting something done and they are willing to help them too. So leaders are in the front moving forward, taking risks and challenging the status quo. They're the ones that say, I don't care. This is how we always have done it. It's not the right thing. We need to try something different. They, um, a job title alone does not make a person a leader. Only a person's behavior determines if he or she occupies a leadership position. So um, a lot of times we'll say, yeah, they're in leadership. Well, leadership, just because you're in a managerial position doesn't mean you're a good leader. There are a lot of direct care nurses that are great leaders and um, work and implement change and, and, ha and ha people want to work with them and want to do what they're doing and work on projects because they motivate them, because they have that natural, natural leadership within them. So some roles of the leadership is they're decision makers, they're communicators, they evaluate, facilitate, they're risk takers, they're an energizer, they're a mentor. Um, this is a big piece. A lot of leaders are, are mentors. That's, that's part of your leadership role is to grow. And leaders want to grow people. They want people to be better. Um, they don't really get um, upset or um, Think that somebody's going to come in and like that there's too many leaders we don't want that that I that this is my role um, they they want to motivate and grow other people um, with them they're critical thinkers they often can offer a buffer I'm sorry that's my dog. <laughs> they can often offer a buffer between others so many times you'll see leaders coming into a conflict and being able to help be that um, resolute help like create that resolution within a conflict they advocate for patients, they advocate for um, different processes and things within the organization. That's a huge piece. They coach, they counsel, they're teachers, they are forecasters looking at the future, like I said, what happened in the past, what's happening now, what's coming, oh, what's gonna be happening next. They're visionary. They can often think of um, grand ideas on ways to uh, help a problem. They're an influencer, they're a creative problem solver, um, they're a change agent, a diplomat, and a role model. So, and the other thing to keep important with leaders is um, leaders need their followers and they need their, they, sometimes leaders can have the grand ideas, but they need those people that can be detail oriented too to help them execute it. Those like administration people, the administrators more. And when I say administration, I don't mean administration like hospital administration. I mean someone that has like a gift or a skill for administration. So they're good at the little task oriented pieces of things. Um, that need to be done because just because you have a grand idea, if you can't work on those minute details of things, sometimes grand ideas can't come to fruition. So it's really important to have all those key players and leaders understand that and they surround themselves with people that are able to help them meet those goals because like they understand their own faults and what they need help and work on so they know what they are good at and what others are good at and bring those people that are good at what needs to happen for their goal with them because they understand they can't complete things on their own. So evaluation of leadership theories, um, great man theory and trait theories. There are, those are, those are two of the kind. There's behavioral theories, authoritarian leader, democratic leader, laissez-faire leader. You can read about these more in your books. I don't want to go into detail and make the, um, presentation too long. Situational and contingency leadership theories, interstructional leadership theories, transitional and transformational leadership, full range leadership theories. And this is the Posey's and Posner's five practices of exemplary leadership. And what it looks at is modeling 
the way so that you, you're the leader and your followers follow you. You model how things need to be. It requires value clarification and self-awareness. So the behavior is contingent with values. Like I've talked about in the past, it's very important for um, leaders to be self-aware of where they are and the things they need to work on as well. They're inspiring a shared vision. Um, this entails visioning that inspires followers to want to participate in the goal achievements. So they're excited about things. They are have this clear vision ahead of them. And because they are so excited about it, it engages others that want to be a part of that. And they want to help attain and achieve that goal with the leader. They challenge, they're challenging the process. Um, they identify opportunities and take action. So like we said a million times, it's not, it's not how we've always done it. It's not necessarily something that has to be changed right now, but, we're, but we could make the process better. We could make things better. So let's do that. Let's look at the process now, see how we can make it better and implement that. Look at those opportunities and really latch onto them and move forward. They enable others to act. They foster collaboration, trust in the sharing of power. This is an important thing with leaders. They don't want to keep all the power to themselves. Leader, with leadership, it's not about them being the one in charge. It's about everybody working together and people knowing their clear goal, knowing their clear roles and feeling empowered to make, make those, take those actions and make a goal happen. Um, they encourage, they're encouraging the heart. They recognize, appreciate, and celebrate followers and the achievement of shared goals. So it's not, it's always a, we did this. We were able to, to accomplish this, not an I. You know, it's very much a team thing within a leader that they don't want to take the full accountability for something. They don't want to be accountable, they, they want to share the, um, share the work that they've done, that it's not all on them, that it's been the team that they've worked together. That's a big part of leadership is understanding that it's, that you, you have the vision and you're helping your um, followers be able to implement it, but nothing would happen without a follower. Transactional leadership, this is the one that focuses on management tasks, um, that you are a care, caretaker, that you trade offs to meet goals. Um, so you may want to, you may have a plan that you want to, that, that the exact vision and plan for how you want to do something, but you hit a roadblock. So, okay, can we do something differently to still meet our goal? And, and that's okay. Does not identify shared values, examines causes, and uses contingency rewards. So um, tell whether the following statement is true or false. A characteristic of leadership management is to use trade-offs to meet goals. True or false? True. Um, trade-offs can be a useful tool to achieve goals. Like we talked about, it, if, you, if you're, you want to you meet your goal and sometimes you can't get exactly what you are wanting, it's okay to trade off sometimes so that you can ultimately meet that goal in the end because that's, that's what you're wanting to do. The transformational leader identifies common values, is committed, inspires others with a vision, has the long-term vision, looks at effects, and empowers others. That's the biggest thing when we keep talking about leaders. Leaders are about empowering others, making others feel cared for, and that they are, that they, they are the ones helping to work for that goal. So integrated leader managers, your gardener, um, Think they think long term. They look outward toward the larger organization. They influence others beyond their own group. So you may be working in one unit and you implement this change and making that influence with some another unit sees what you guys did and they're like, oh, that's amazing. We wanna we wanna do that too. They emphasize vision, values, and motivation. They are politically astute. They think in terms of change and renewal. And that is actually the end of our chapter two presentation. Make sure that you actually read chapter two um, to get all the information and what, um, review the chapter three. So unit one will be chapter one, two, and three. And we'll see you later. Bye guys. Maybe. If I can get my screen to stop.